as we now turn to God's word. And we continue in the book of Joshua. We continue in the story of the people of Israel as they are following God's lead into the promise, the land that he has promised to them. And so we continue in chapter 6. We'll read a portion of it and then turn to chapter 7. Now let us listen to God's word. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carrying trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout And then the wall of the city will collapse, and the army will go up, and everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, Advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. And when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. And the armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once, and then the army returned to the camp and spent the night there. And Joshua got up early the next morning. The priests took up the ark of the Lord, and the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. And the armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard following the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. And they did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. And the seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring on your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring bring trouble on it. All the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. And when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged in and they took the city. And they devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed what the sword, everything living in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent them from Jericho to Ai, which is near Bethan, to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And when they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not worry about the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gates as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. And the elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their foreheads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. 
Pardon your servant, Lord, but what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, Stand up. What are, you, what, you are doing, what are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded to them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy what among you is devoted to destruction. So go, consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, we give thanks for this word. It is a challenging word for us today, a familiar story, but as we take a closer look at it, God, we pray that you would give us insight and understanding by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, please be seated. I thank you for standing for that reading. It was a good reading, a necessary reading. You know, obedience is considered somewhat of a dirty word today. I don't know if you've ever thought of that, but obedience. You know, dogs go to obedience school, right? But today, when we think about it, when it's applied to people, it's a word that feels ancient at best and perhaps taboo at worst. And I think this is true for many reasons. You know, today we are self-made men and we are self-made women. We're even self-made youth and self-made children. We mark our own path. We craft our own identity. We make a name for ourselves. Or at least that's what society tells us to do. You know, those who have served in any of the armed forces probably are ones who value obedience outright because they are well in life and death consequences if they don't. But this idea of obedience or being obedient to something or to someone other than ourselves and our own inclinations is harder for us everyday folks. It's harder for us to understand, especially, I want to say, I want to suggest today. Now there's another layer added when we talk about being followers of Jesus Christ and a people committed, loyal to the one true God. But the word obedience isn't named in the passage that we read through today, that passage from Joshua. The question still remains, will God's people obey God? Perhaps put another way for us today, how do we as God's people understand God's call to obedience in an age where the adage is, to thine own self be true? Our passage today lifts up a comparison between the two cities, the city of Jericho. That's one of those familiar stories. A lot of times Sunday school children or VBS, you know, play act out that marching around the city of Jericho. So it's a comparison between the city of Jericho, which is that gateway city to the promised land, and this other city, I, which is the second target in this plan of taking over this land. If you will, it's a tale of two cities. But the story's focus is not so much on the cities themselves or even on Israel. It's really more about God's battle and God's plan and how Israel is or isn't going to be a part of it. So here's what's happening. There was a lot in that passage. I want to break it down a bit for us. God's had Joshua prepare the Israelites for battle for entering the promised land. They've reestablished the covenant. If you were here last week, you heard from Pastor Richard Nordgren about the circumcision that happened right before um, this time, this approach to the city of Jericho. Joshua has been given instructions on how this small band of brothers is going to conquer the city. 
and it involves some guerrilla war tactics like shouting and brandishing their weapons, you know, basically portraying themselves as tough stuff against this fortified city. They're going to keep them in suspense too. They're not going to attack right away. They take one march around in one giving day for six days, and finally it's on the seventh day. They march around seven times until Joshua gives the word go. So they're going to keep them in suspense. And if you know anything about siege warfare, you know it's a pretty miserable thing, right? The city is cut off from its supplies. There's no access to retreat. Still, in any other situation, this would be an insurmountable task for the likeness of Israel. Israel is a small nation up against this fortified city that, again, acts as this gateway to the land beyond. But what's amazing to us and what's unique to this story is that they triumph. It's set up in such a way that we understand, though, that it is not Israel's triumph. It is God's triumph, right? It's David against Goliath. It is God's triumph. And so Israel is simply joining forces with God. What's important to note is that they do so by following God's instructions to the letter. We've been reading in Joshua about how God has given them all of these detailed instructions all along. And this is the same, the very same. Put another way, They obey God's commandments. So their obedience to God in this seemingly impossible situation allows them to make the most of God's opportunity, the opportunity that he sets before them. But that is not what happens when it comes to this city of Ai, this other city, right? As Israel turns their sights to this next target, you know, they're talking about those people who sent, were sent out to scope out the land. Again, they send out spies. And those who return say, this is going to be a piece of cake compared to Jericho. In fact, we don't need to send the whole army. We just need a few, just a portion. But in the end, they cannot conquer I. In fact, they are the ones who are conquered. They are the ones who come back, their tails between their legs. They are the ones whose hearts are melting like water, within them. They're afraid and they're wondering now, where is God in all this? Why didn't he give us this easy victory? Hey, we just conquered this huge city. What about this small village? What does this say about how this is going? And so we see how Joshua, he grieves the shame of this defeat. He tears his clothes. The elders, the leaders of Israel put dust on their foreheads, and then Joshua plants himself face down and asks God, why? Why is this happening? What's going on? And it's at this point in the story in which we zoom in, and we zoom in on a particular person, a Han. A Han is a single actor in this story, and a Han is a warrior in God's army. And as we find out, a Han did not obey God's command. If you remember back when they were conquering Jericho, there was a particular instruction, do not take for yourselves any of the devoted things. But Ahan sneaks a couple of these small things out, and he buries them, as we find out later, he buries them under his tent so that no one will find out. And you know, if it wasn't that God was was an omniscient, Ahan might have gotten away with it, but you and I know that God sees everything. We cannot hide anything from God, right? So Ahan's deceit is discovered, and according to God, Ahan's singular action is the root cause of Israel's defeat in I. Now we may wonder why God would concern himself with what amounts to, as we learn later on, a robe a bag of silver and a gold bar. That's what Ahan steals. That's what Ahan buries under his tent. And what, what use would God have of such things? Now, as the text noted, these are what God calls devoted things. And really what these are is that all the trinkets, all the symbols, all the gold, all the silver 
of this people that Israel is conquering, many of them are used in the worship of their gods, the Canaanite gods. And so what God asks some is, I want you to destroy this, or if you cannot destroy it, like things that are metal, I want you to put it in the treasury. I do not want you to have them. One of the things that God knows right off the bat is that this people in this endeavor could be very easily influenced. God doesn't want to put the Israelites in a place, in a position, in a situation of anything potentially destructive. He doesn't want to put them there. And that's why he commands them to destroy these things that have been dedicated to another god, to other gods. He doesn't want them to come within feet of them. Now, when we take a step back from these two cities and their stories, we gain a couple of questions and a couple of insights. And I want to share with you what these are. You know, what we realize very quickly is that while God is working to fulfill his promise to Israel, God is also leveling consequences on these certain cities and these peoples in the land of Canaan. You know, it's the other side of the story that we can't easily put aside. If you've been reading through the book of Joshua as we've been going through the sermon series, you may have come across this, and maybe there had been a question mark in your mind. You know, it's that niggle in the back of our minds when we read this heroic story of little Israel against these giants, that these giants have names, and these giants have families and homes, and they are human beings. And I think it's important to pause a minute in this way because we're going to see this come up again and again. You know, when we hear and read about God asking the people of Israel to take over this land, it's not a friendly takeover. God is asking them, or it seems to be, asking them to go to war. And we have to wonder, why would God want them to go to war? Why would he want this kind of thing to happen? You know, one thing we know from other Old Testament books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy is that these particular people, the Canaanites, are morally corrupt. They are not following the ways of God. And so their sin condemns them. Now that still may not justify what appears to us as God initiating genocide. And that's really the elephant in the room when we read through Old Testament stories like these. We read phrases like totally destroy or leave no survivors. We read the same in Joshua. And these phrases leave us feeling uncomfortable about what's happening and why, asking that question, why? And I think rightly so. You know, I wish I could give you a perfectly satisfactory answer to this. There are many things in the Bible that leaves us feeling uh, a wonder or a questioning. But I can offer a couple of insights that may help us find a way to a certain degree of understanding. You know, it is often the case that biblical language has a purpose. The way the Bible speaks says as much as what the Bible speaks. And in the Bible, we can find expressions of hyperbole. That's exaggeration. Okay? In the ancient Near East, battles were often told with these kinds of non-literal phrases. Totally destroy, leave no survivors. One of the reasons why we can draw this conclusion, especially here in Joshua, is because when we read on, we discover that the inhabitants are still living there. So they are totally destroyed, but the towns still exist. They are totally destroyed, but God advises Israel not to intermarry with them. They are totally destroyed, but God gives them guidelines on how to interact with them in business. God instructs Israel to totally destroy, but we have the story of Rahab and how she is saved. And we have the story even of Ahan, of Israel, who is not. So we see and we find these exceptions. So what I want to say is that when God uses these words, totally destroy, leave no survivors, it's more likely 
that he's suggesting completely defeat, right? And the best way I can think of this, perhaps an everyday example for us, is when, when we're playing the game of golf, for any of us who play the game of golf, right? So let's say I am playing a game of golf against someone, and I win with a score of 55. It could happen. I'm playing the PGA. It's my illustration. I can be playing the PGA. So I'm playing a game of golf against someone, and I score 55. Now, at the end of the game, I might step back, and I might say something like, man, I killed him, right? Now, I didn't really kill him. I didn't literally kill him, but I defeated him without any question, right? So in some way, that's how we can think of these phrases that are used. But one more thing I want to add. It's also true that this story captures a particular people at a particular time in history. And for me, this is when the Bible is descriptive not prescriptive. It describes something. It doesn't necessarily command something. And I would argue strongly that we can never take what we see here with Israel and Canaan and assume that God prescribes for us to take the same approach with others. You know, I want to say that God doesn't expect us to totally destroy those who we observe are not following God's ways, just like with the Canaanites, quote-unquote. That is not, I believe, what God is saying here. It would be wrong, and it would be unjust, and it would be immoral. In fact, when it comes to the other nations, the other nations beyond the ones that are named and identified in stories like in Joshua, God's command, God's prescribed approach is to seek peace first. Joining forces with God then requires trust, great trust. Trust in God's integrity. Trust in God's pursuit of good for all. But it remains that joining forces with God also requires obedience. And for Israel, this means not just trusting in the God who makes promises, but obeying the God who expects much of them. And and obedience is important in the little and the large because God knows what's at stake. And what's at at stake is is their souls and their lives and their future with God. In fact, in this episode here at I, we see the first time in the promised land the people of Israel breaking covenant vow. And I wish I could say it is the last The stakes are such that God can't allow even one devoted thing to catch their hearts. God is a jealous God, and he's a jealous God for the reason that he knows how easily human hearts are swayed. What I think, too, is that God knows Israel can live up to her potential, everything that God expects of her. But only if the people lean fully on God. You know, only God knows what they're up against. And only God knows how they can navigate that land and through all those other nations. There was this game that I used to play when I was growing up in the church in youth group, and um, we were to pair up, and one partner was to be blindfolded, and the other partner was to lead them through this obstacle course. It had um, hazards in it, it had speed bumps, and the partner who was not blindfolded had a little bit of time to go through the course and become familiar with the lay of the land. Now, what often got people in trouble when we were playing this game was when the blindfolded partner attempted to run the course for themselves. What I want to say is if you were launched, if you were being launched into an unknown with life and death consequences, would you rather go at it on your own? Or would you rather go with the one who knows the lay of the land? You know, our first inclination might be to go at it on our own. But God's leading is sure. And God's navigation is trustworthy. We move toward our best when we step out with God. 
Now, I've asked for David Fortescue, he's our, our friend joining us this morning, to come and share a little bit because I have to think, and this thought struck me this week, I have to think that being called to serve where you serve, in the ways that you serve, that you've encountered God asking you to come into a place of obedience and what that might be like. And I've asked David to come and join us for a moment and to share a little bit of his experience in God's call to obedience in his life. David, you can actually come here. Yep, go ahead and come here. I'm going to move this over. Nope, I'm not going to take it out. I'm going to have you join me here. Thank you. Is that on? Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, yeah, to come to a place for me, it was actually how the Lord led me to come to the States and prepare me to be able to go back home. So I actually uh, been born and raised in Zimbabwe. I actually had my own business as an electrician. And I came to a place, having been in the world for 10 years, I was unable to reach my, my unbelieving friends. The uh, Bible actually talks a bit about that. Even though I grew up in the church, I still didn't have the answers to bring them. So I decided I, I really need to go to Bible college. I need to go to a place where I can learn about God so that I can m- reach to those people. But a couple of things had to happen for me. I had to step out of my comfort zone, and I had to put some faith in God. I was coming to a country that had never left uh, Africa, never been where there was snow, so I was, I, there were a lot of apprehensions. Like I, was, I really felt like I was going to come here and die in America. And was I going to have enough clothing? And so as I stepped out from that, I sold my electrical business and had enough money to pay my first year of Bible college. And I had two suitcases. I was leaving everything behind. And I was going for a four-year program. And so as I stepped out from that, with every anxiety, knowing that, how do I tell the Bible college, I actually really don't have enough money to finish this out. <laughs> and I arrived here, and I was already in my 30s, so it wasn't like I was in my youth and I could go and flip uh, hamburgers at McDonald's or something like that. And so when I got to Bible college, I began to do a job at the college. So that started to give me some money for part of the way. But it was never going to pay at all. And so one day from class, I came back from class, and my roommate was being handcuffed and taken away from the college. So I was a bit shocked, you know, coming from Africa, and I'm giving my whole life to follow God, and my roommate at Bible college is going to jail. I'm like, like, where am I, you know? Like, this is not meant to be how God's children live. And uh, God's orchestrating and playing this all out already. And that's what I want you to see in this. I could not line up all these ducks if I tried in my own capacity. But the lady who had stuff stolen, so this friend of mine, this is my roommate, had stolen computers from the home that he, got, he was raised in. Uh, it was called Hope House, uh, a place for kids in, in Idaho. And so she took me out to dinner and was like worried that I was this international student at Bible College and my roommate's going to jail. And she was the one who was actually making sure he goes to jail. She took me out to dinner and, said, and, and explained the story. And then asked her, what are you doing here? And I said, well, when I'm done. I'm going to go back to Zimbabwe and actually help in an orphanage be started there. And uh, so she said, well, isn't that amazing? I actually run a home for children here. So while you're in the States, why don't you come and work with me? And you learn what you, what you can, some of that stuff I'll need back home. And so she gave me, paid the college money, and gave me free board and lodging in the States. And after four years, I owed the Bible college $250, having not had enough to go and to come there. And so the Lord has then sent me back home to my own people to go and minister to them and to show them who Christ is and can be in their life if they would accept that. But I had to have faith. That I was selling everything that I was depending on, my, my livelihood as a business. I was selling that and going with two suitcases and enough money for one year. That took an incredible faith for me to do. Not without concern, but as I took that step and moved out, God began to work in my life. I couldn't have orchestrated a fellow student to be arrested and go and to be able to get me a job. And, and that I would earn enough money and live at the same time while I'm here 
to be able to finish up what I started. And then today, here I am in Zimbabwe, my wife and I, and we're reaching out to the local people in a desperate situation in Zimbabwe. And we're bringing people to know Jesus. And we have faith that he is going to continue that. What I need to do is just be obedient to the work that he's called me to and press on day after day. It's in that obedience. And that's where God's blessing what we're doing. And more and more people are coming to know Jesus through that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. You know, when it comes to joining forces with God today, that call to obedience is still relevant. And it's not just about trusting in the God who makes promises, but obeying the God who expects much of us. God expects much of us because he knows the landscape of our lives. He knows he can orchestrate all those things that we cannot see. And he also knows the demands on our time and the demands on our attention. I think that's one of the challenges for us today where we live here. He knows the things that come at us all day long, every day. And these things demand our love and they demand our loyalty. And it can be anything from brand loyalty to company loyalty. And all that has the potential to draw us incrementally away from the loyalty that God expects of us. You know, God also knows our potential. Just like with Israel, God knows how we can best step out with him. Now, what I want to say is that there is a difference between trusting God and obeying God. You know, when we trust, trusting is believing that what God says he'll do. And obedience is acting on that trust. God doesn't allow us to follow blindly. He doesn't want us, I should say, to follow blindly. In fact, I would say that our obedience as the people of God is best given when it comes out of gratitude for what God has already done for us. Because the fact is that God moves towards us in faith long before we move toward him. And the fact is that God has fulfilled many promises to us long before he asks us to risk for him. And so once we start recognizing what God has already done in our lives, we are then free to serve God, and not slavishly, but out of awe and reverence. And it is in this free and grateful obedience that we mark ourselves, we show ourselves to be the people of God. You know, as one biblical writer says, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that we may declare the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into light. Once we were not a people, but now we are a people of God. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. Amen? Let's pray. God, we know your call is a call of faith and trust and obedience, of acting on how we know you to have acted already in our lives. And we pray, God, that you would continue to urge us in that, in that way of following in your footsteps, even when we don't know all the pieces and the future involved. But God, as we trust you more, we learn of you more. And as we learn of you more and who you are and how much you love us, God, we can ease into our future with great expectation. And so we pray, God, that this word would inspire us, would motivate us in the ways that you are calling us, in the ways that you are leading us. And for this, we give you our thanks. Amen.